Okay, good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure now to um, introduce the third Early Career Spotlight uh, talk at this conference. And um, now we are going to have uh, Sergey Levin here from uh, Berkeley. Um, Sergey actually started uh, to study computer science at uh, Stanford, where he also got his PhD four years ago in 2014 after which he uh, went to Berkeley, where he also became assistant professor recently, and, um, the, um, and since then is still in Berkeley with a small detour via UW, as far as I learned. Um, he's actually well known uh, for his work on, uh, in machine learning, particularly deep learning in combination with reinforcement learning. Uh, we all have, uh, or many of us actually know his videos and, um, and pictures from many robots learning to grasp objects, and I guess we will uh, learn a little bit more uh, throughout this talk today. Um, he is also well known in, in the press, so whenever he has new results, then uh, there's a high chance that you can see this in a newspaper article. Um, so he is actually a rising star, as it is always the case with our early career candidates. Um, yesterday we learned that uh, robotics is a POMDP. I guess now we will learn that robotics is a deep network, and uh, I leave the rest to the discussion afterwards. Sergey. Thank you, Wolfram. All right, so uh, as Wolfram mentioned, I work on robotic learning, and in my group, uh, we're, uh, what we do is we develop new robotic learning algorithms, new algorithms for deep learning and reinforcement learning, and we evaluate those algorithms on real-world robotic systems. And in particular, what we're really concerned about is developing algorithms that are highly general, that are very broadly applicable, because we think that this is critical to make it possible for robots to act intelligently in complex, unstructured environments. So the, the tools that we build on uh, very often are based on large, high-capacity parametric models, which is deep learning, and algorithms for automated sequential decision-making, which is reinforcement learning. And the argument that I'm gonna try to make to you today is that these ingredients will be critical to make it possible for robots to act intelligently in complex, unstructured environments. I think this argument is often made by folks who work on robotic learning and deep learning, sometimes in a slightly clumsy way. So it's very tempting to say that, well, deep learning has worked really well for you know, all sorts of applications, from computer vision to speech recognition, and therefore it will work well for robots because that's kind of like the logical next thing. I think this is, of course, a little bit simplistic. There are very severe challenges in robotics that make it very different from kind of yet another application of deep learning. Uh, in a lot of places where deep learning has succeeded, we have the luxury of having IID data. In robotics, when you choose an action, it's gonna affect the next thing that you see, so your data is clearly not IID. In many situations where deep learning has worked well, we have very large labeled data sets. In robotics, where you get your data, how the actual labels are, are produced, and how large the data set is, those are all very big challenges. But in spite of these challenges, I do think that robotic learning and deep learning in particular can offer us tools to attack a range of problems that have been unassailable for decades, and this is what I'm gonna try to uh, show you today. So if we're concerned with building a robotic system for a narrow application, a closed world environment, then it's possible to hand engineer a solution that works very well. So this is the case for robots in factories, for example, and so forth. But if we want robotic systems that can succeed in open world, highly diverse environments, then we need to think about generality. We need to think about systems that can adapt and that can carry out a very diverse repertoire of skills. So if you want to build, let's say, a household robot, that robot doesn't just need to do one thing. It needs to do many things. It needs to be able to do a variety of chores in a variety of homes. If you want to build a disaster relief robot, it needs to be able to generalize to overcome whatever obstacle it might encounter. If you want to build, a, let's say, a robotic repairman, it needs a large repertoire of skills to perform whatever repair task is put before it. And it's, um, it's very tempting, especially in machine learning, to make kind of bold assertions that, well, we've achieved superhuman performance on X. You know, we've built the superhuman something, whatever the next thing is. And for many of these things, if you look at what is actually being, you know, described as superhuman, it's a narrow uh, application. And when it comes to flexibility, to adaptability and generality, humans still dominate. If your robot is faced with you know, a complex, messy environment like this and it's asked to do some task here, maybe locate a particular object or clean up the room, this is a fiendishly complex, messy environment where the physicality and the perception become enormously challenging. And on the topic of kind of the superhuman performance, in many of the places where we have seen things that can be claimed as superhuman, it's really kind of things that uh, deal more with higher level logical reasoning and things of that type, the kind of stuff that to us seems very difficult, hence super. Uh, but in robotics, time and time again, what we've seen is the things that are hard are the things that to us are easy. 
Uh, and this is, of course, uh, something that goes by the name of Moravec's paradox. I, I want to illustrate it with a few pictures to make it a little more concrete. In 1997, the world champion at chess was defeated by uh, a computer, and this is a picture of that match. And then maybe my question to you is, we'll spot the robot playing chess in this picture. From 2016, this is the world champion uh, defeated again by a computer. And again, we don't see the robot actually picking up the pieces. This is not a facetious statement. You know, there's actually a reason for that, uh, that the, the low-level behaviors are actually extremely difficult, even though to us they seem like they should be extremely straightforward. And maybe one of the ways that we can start to understand why this is so difficult is by comparing how people do some of these things to how machines do. So we can look at, for example, a video of a person doing an everyday task, opening a door. And one of the things you can notice about this uh, behavior, well, of course, it's, it's very fluid, it's very quick, but also there's, you can hardly spot any, any situation where the person pauses or does something that looks like planning. Sensing and control are very tightly intertwined. In this case, sensing is touch sensing. This per, the, the subject here is actually blindfolded. So the human just goes for the task and does everything together in a, in a loop. And this tight coupling between perception and control, we see it time and time again in other areas. For example, hand-eye coordination when you're using tools, driving a car or catching a ball. And if you watch a robot performing a task like this, uh, this is actually you know, quite, quite relevant given the talks this morning. This is a very capable robot performing the door opening task in the DARPA Robotics Challenge. You know, when we say that something looks robotic, what that really means is that when we look at the behavior, you can kind of pick out the segments. You can pick out, oh, here the robot was sensing, here it was planning, and now it's acting. The sensing, planning, acting pipeline. This is something that roboticists are all very familiar with. Humans also sense, plan, and act. They have to in order to carry out these tasks, but they do everything all together in a loop. Everything is very tightly coupled. And this tight coupling between perception and control, I think, is one of the key ingredients for powerful and highly generalizable sensory motor skills. So then we might say, okay, well, what's the big deal? Can't we just, let's just couple perception and control and be done with it? Uh, the trouble is that perception is very complicated. Perception here doesn't just mean, you know, you've detected the location of the object and you're going to close the loop on the 3D coordinate of that object. Perception is hard, and the, the entirety of the computer vision field has been concerned with this problem for a very long time. Perception for sensory motor control is not any easier. It's every bit as hard as the complete computer vision problem. So that means that if we're to close the loop on high bandwidth modalities like vision, audition, touch sensing, et cetera, we need to be able to make use of the very best tools available in fields that have dealt with a full brunt of that problem. And simply directly applying existing techniques in deep learning to these uh, uh, challenges is difficult because, as I said before, the success of deep learning so far in supervised learning domains has hinged on things like the availability of large label data sets. So a very uh, critical, critical challenge for us if we're going to try to do sensory motor control with these kind of high capacity representations that can handle raw sensing is figuring out, you know, where are, am I going to get my data set and who's going to label it for me? So then the next thing we might say, well, doesn't reinforcement learning give us the answer to that? Reinforcement learning gives us a formalism that we can use to formulate an objective, and then we can hang whatever parametric model we want off of that objective and train it, and it will do perception and control for us. In fact, we've seen successes of deep reinforcement learning in a number of domains, you know, playing games, learning locomotion, uh, simple manipulation tasks, and, and so on. But the critical thing about deep learning for complex perception problems like computer vision is that it doesn't just require a deep network. It requires a large and diverse data set. That's where the generalization really comes from. So if you imagine doing reinforcement learning with sufficiently diverse data to generalize effectively, if you're iteratively collecting data, improving your behavior, collecting more data, and so on, you're essentially faced with this challenge where you're collecting kind of an image net sized chunk of experience every time you want to modify your behavioral strategy or you confine yourself to a limited setting where maybe you're learning the skill in the lab, but then you have this problem, you know, how can you generalize effectively without being able to train on large data sets? The answer is that you almost certainly can't, that you need to find a way to bridge this uh, problem. And what we need, I think, to accomplish that is we need algorithms for scalable off-policy reinforcement learning, algorithms that can actually consume data that was collected perhaps with other policies in other situations, maybe even for completely different tasks, and we need data sets that can be used to learn closed-loop robotic skills, to learn closed-loop robotic skills that actually generalize effectively, that actually cover a wide, uh, broad uh, sort of slice of the world. So to, in order to get deep learning techniques to work on robotic learning problems, I think it needs to look more like training on ImageNet and less like, you know, the Atari games and, and Go, where uh, 
you have large data sets, except that they're for closed loop control, and they need to be labeled automatically without human provided labels, because a, of course a person can't sit down and write down for you what joint torques the robot needs to apply in order to accomplish some task given an image. It's a closed loop process, and you need to acquire the supervision automatically. So how can we try to design a system that does something like this? Uh, what I think we need to do is we need to figure out a large-scale off-policy reinforcement learning framework, something where the robot has interacted with the world in the past, it has done a variety of different tasks, and now it's going to use all of the experience that it's collected for those tasks to uh, train a model to do something, whatever it is that it aims to accomplish next, and occasionally that model might choose to interact with the world a little bit more to basically find the corner cases to tease out those difficult situations that are not yet in the data set, but the bulk of the generalization, the ability to handle unforeseen circumstances and new uh, situations is going to come from the diverse off-policy data. So how do we build off-policy algorithms that can use large data sets? Well, in a, wor in a single word, all, of the, all the things that I'm gonna cover, they're basically based around prediction. Learning a policy directly from off-policy data is hard because you need to actually use that policy to interact with the world, which is expensive. But prediction, that can use lots of off-policy data, and prediction can be either model-based or model-free. A model-based algorithm for prediction, that's just a model-based reinforcement learning. It means you're going to predict future observations, given your current observation and action. And a model-free algorithm is going to predict rewards. It's going to predict a value function, which is also a prediction about the future, but it's specific to a particular task. So I'll talk about two algorithms in this talk primarily that fall into, into these two categories, and I'll start with a model-based version. So here we're going to learn to predict the future. So the framework, very similar to what I outlined before, you have a robot that has interacted with the world, it has collected a large amount of interaction experience. We can formally denote this as tuples of the state observation S, the action A, and the next state observation S prime. And then the robot is going to train a model which makes predictions about the next state given the state and action, uh, given the state the robot is in now and the action that it's considering to execute. This model is trained for many epochs and off-policy data and occasionally will go out and interact with the world a little bit more to collect some more experience if necessary. So if we're talking about real-world robotic systems that have to actually deal with complex unstructured environments, the observations, the state observations S here are going to be the raw readings from the robot sensors. We don't know necessarily what objects are out there in the world or how many of them there are or whether it'll change day to day. So the only thing we can really count on is that our, our senses will stay the same. So for example, we're using a camera, it'll remain a camera and it will have the same resolution, but everything else is up to nature. So if we're building predictive models, that means that we're actually predicting literally what the robot will see next. So the method that I'll cover, this is really, uh, was described in these uh, three papers. It was uh, initially led by Chelsea Finn and then more recently also by Frederick Ebert and Alex Lee. So to start off with, we're gonna collect that large data set. As I mentioned, it's an off-policy method, so we can collect the data set in a variety of different ways. But one thing that works well if you're starting from scratch is to basically play with things in the world at random. So in the same way that you can imagine a child playing with the world to learn essentially how physics works, uh, we can have our robots playing with the world by executing random actions, pushing things around, and observing the consequences of those actions. And that's going to provide our initial data set. Then, uh, once we get that data set, we're going to train a model. It's going to be a, a recurrent convolutional model that will take in the current image and a sequence of potential future actions and predict the potential future images. And here on the slide in these two rows, you can see some of the predictions made by this model. So the top row shows predictions for one initial image, the bottom row shows predictions for a different initial image, and the, the different columns are for different actions. And you can see that for different actions, the model predicts that the arm will move around in reasonably plausible ways. It gets a little fuzzy and uncertain. And when the arm hits an object, the object also moves. So it's starting to understand something about physics. And I would emphasize that this method is trained in a very general purpose way. So the only thing it's asked to do is predict the pixels accurately. It's not told anything about physics or collisions or even the nature of objects, just pixels. Now next we need to give it a, a goal somehow. We need to have a user be able to specify, I want the robot to do something. So what the user will do is click on a point in the image to specify that red dot, that's the starting point, and click on another point that's the green dot and say move whatever is under that red dot to the green dot. Remember, a priori the model doesn't know anything about objects, it has to figure that out from the data. And then of course we can make predictions for different actions, and the model can also tell you where does it think this red dot will move. So over here, in these, for this second and third action, it seems to be predicting that it will actually move the object to the right that's indicated by the heat map, so those seem like plausible actions for doing the thing the user asked. And then we can execute it. <laughs> 
Now remember, I mentioned that we want to do closed loop control. And the way that we close the loop on this, of course, is that every time that the robot takes an action, if what happened sort of deviates from its prediction, we can replan. And this is called model predictive control. The only difference is now it's doing model predictive control on raw images. So that replanning gives us the closed loop capability, and we can do more complex tasks. For example, the robot can imagine reaching out and dragging the stapler and executing in the real world, and indeed, that's what it does. Of course, the execution in the real world doesn't perfectly match the prediction, and that's where closing the loop comes in. Uh, since everything is trained from raw pixels, you don't need to confine yourself to rigid objects. You can handle uh, soft deformable objects like this cloth, for example. And I should also emphasize that for these videos that I'm showing, many of the objects are actually novel objects that were never seen during training, so the model is effectively generalizing based on its understanding of kind of intuitive physics to new things that it didn't see before. Here's a newer experiment that we did. This is actually using two images, so you can think of it as kind of a binocular setup. And uh, here in the middle, we're showing the prediction, so it imagines that it will grab this tape dispenser and pull it, and that's what it does. And now we're gonna interrupt it and we're gonna perturb the object. We're gonna pull it to a different location that surprises the robot, and then it has to correct uh, and recover. Here's another example here. The robot has figured out kind of an interesting strategy for moving this whiteboard eraser. It figured out that actually, if it closes its fingers around the object, it can grab it pretty securely, and that's a good way to accurately reposition it to the target destination. Okay, so that's model-based uh, learning, where we're actually predicting what we'll see next. Model-based learning is very good because we can use the same model to perform a variety of different tasks at test time, but if we know that there's a particular task we're going to be accomplishing, then we can also use model-free algorithms that actually predict future rewards to get something that's more focused on the task that we really want to solve. So to introduce this framework, I'm gonna set up a little bit of a, a additional notation. So we're gonna have, like before, our robot has interacted with the world. It collected a large data set of these tuples S, A, S prime. And now when we train our model, that model is gonna be predicting future rewards, which means that it's also going to get as input this reward function that tells it which of these states, are, states uh, is more preferable. We'll train it for many epochs, and occasionally it'll again interact with the world to try to uh, tease out those corner cases. In reinforcement learning, our goal is to maximize the sum of rewards over time. So that's the reinforcement learning objective. A very useful object for dealing with this objective is called the Q function. The Q function tells us that if you start in a particular state and then take an action, this is the total reward that you'll accumulate for the remainder of the episode. And if you have a Q function, you can recover a policy from that Q function simply by executing the action that the Q function thinks has the largest value. So this is how you can take a predictive model, which is the Q function, and get a policy out of it. And the nice thing about Q functions is that if you can get your Q function to obey this equation, the, the Q function at some state in action is equal to the reward plus the maximum over the actions at the next state. If it obeys this equation, it is the optimal Q function, which means that the policy you recover from it is the optimal policy. So from this, we can derive a very straightforward algorithm for learning to, uh, to acquire optimal Q functions simply by trying to enforce this equation at all the trans transitions that we observed. So for all these transitions over here, learn to satisfy this equation. And this basically gets us the fitted Q iteration algorithm. Uh, so you don't need on-policy data to do this. You can do this with a buffer of off-policy data. Uh, you collect a data set using some policy, add it to your buffer, and then in an inner loop, you sample a batch from that buffer, minimize the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation, and repeat. And then occasionally you go out and get more data. This is a very high-level sketch of this algorithm. Of course, in practice, the details matter quite a bit. But one thing that I do want to point out is that I, I sketch this out very sequentially. In reality, you can implement it in a very parallel way. So you can have one process that's interacting with the world and pulling in new transitions, storing them in your buffer, and a separate process that's pulling from that buffer and training your Q function. And these processes can be completely decoupled. In fact, they can also be parallelized. So over here, you might have multiple robots. Over here, you might have mul multiple workers, multiple computers, and so on. So this is what we did in a recent paper that actually just came out yesterday called QT Opt. And I, I wanna emphasize this work was uh, the, the result of a collaboration with a, quite a few very talented collaborators led by uh, Dmitry Kalashnikov. And in QT Opt, the idea was to extend this Q-learning algorithm to a robotic setting with continuous actions and then apply it to the task of closed-loop robotic grasping. So our goal here is to try to frame grasping as a dynamic process where the robot dynamically reacts to what it's seeing and can learn from large amounts of off-policy data in order to generalize effectively. So in one process, we have live data collection, in this case with seven robots that are collecting data, attempting to grasp objects in the world, and we have stored experience from past interactions. We're going to load the past interactions into an off-policy training buffer and the live interactions into a separate on-policy buffer, and the live interactions are also stored to disk so that in subsequent experiments we can just load up everything we've had so far. 
Now remember that our goal is to minimize the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that Bellman equation, and we're dealing with continuous actions, so that maximization operator is actually quite difficult for us to deal with. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our parametric Q function is going to be represented by a convolutional neural network, and we'll have a collection of Bellman updater workers. So these are actually going to be sep separate machines that are going to be running multiple threads that will crawl over the on-policy and off-policy buffer, and their sole job is to compute the right-hand side of that Bellman equation. They're going to compute R plus max Q, and that maximization requires actually running an inner loop stochastic optimizer to perform the max. So that's what these guys are going to be doing and they'll save out the result of their maximization to a separate labeled buffer. And that labeled buffer has states, actions, and their Q target values produced by the Bellman updaters. And then we can have a separate collection of training threads that will pull from the labeled buffer, and all they're doing is regression. They're just regressing from the output of the Q network to these QT values. That's why we call the algorithm QT opt. So this is a large-scale parallelized Q learning algorithm, and we can use it to learn a dynamic closed-loop grasping skill. So here's the setup at test time for grasping. The, the sensing comes from an RGB over-the-shoulder camera, so there's actually no depth sensing in the system. This is what the camera sees. It just gets the over-the-shoulder view. Uh, and the robot gets to control the gripper in three dimensions, rotate it about the, the vertical axis, and open and close the fingers. And it can open and close the, fing the fingers as many times as it wants, so it can do things like probe the object to try to find a good grasp. We trained the system on about 1,000 training objects uh, with about 600,000 training uh, attempts. So that's quite a large number, but it's not outside the realm of what's uh, feasible with uh, real-world robotic systems. The network that's estimated in the Q function has 1.2 million parameters, so it's a large convolutional neural network, and we need quite a few parameters because we do want this thing to generalize effectively to new objects that it's never seen before. Uh, and I should emphasize that the only grasp-specific feature in this whole scheme is actually the reward function. So the action parameterization and so on, they can be applied just as well to other manipulation tasks. The reward function is simply one if the robot picked up an object uh, and zero otherwise. So let's first look at the quantitative results. Uh, we had some prior work on using multiple robots to learn grasping systems. This is from 2016. We actually used a different robot for that system, uh, but we recollected new data so that we could do a head-to-head -head comparison. So the previous system used uh, greedy actions, which meant that it just choose, chose the action that would maximize the probability of the successful grasp at the next time step. QT opt does long horizon reasoning, so it can actually learn to perform things like pre-grasp manipulations in order to maximize the probability of eventual grasp success. And we'll see that qualitatively in a second. In the comparison, the prior method used 900,000 grasp attempts, the new one 600,000, so it's a little more efficient. And we tested it on uh, about 700 grasps on a collection of fairly difficult test objects that included small objects, large objects, transparent objects, and so on. We found that the previous system on this data set had a success rate of about 78%, a bit lower than what we had in the, in the paper because these objects are a bit harder. The new system had a success rate of 96%, so more than a 5x reduction in the number of errors. And this really comes from that closed loop reasoning, which I'm gonna show you uh, in a second. So here's a video of the system in action. To me, actually, watching the qualitative results is quite a bit more interesting than the numbers because from watching the qualitative results, we can see what it does very differently. So remember that the door opening example that I showed before where the person had this closed loop strategy. Here, the robot is solving this puzzle uh, that has never seen before, and you can't grasp all these blocks in one go. You have to actually singulate them. You have to push them apart. The singulation was not programmed into the robot. This is something that the policy figured out on its own, that if it has multiple objects that are clumped together, it needs to push them apart to pick out the individual ones. Now, the blocks are not too hard to grasp, except for that round block that's, uh, that's in the middle. So that one slips out of the gripper. This is actually not a failure. The robot actually didn't terminate the episode. It figured out that this thing is not in the gripper, so it should go in and pick up something else. Now, it does have to pick up the green block, and what it does is it actually probes it a few times until it finds a secure grasp. So it's watching its fingers. It's a dynamical process, and once it sees that it has a firm hold on this object, then it continues. So eventually, this robot can pick up all the objects in the bin uh, and uh, empty the bin. Now, we're going to test it next on a slightly harder setup. We have some heavy objects, some small objects, a round tennis ball, and to make it even harder, we're going to mess with it a little bit. And even when we mess with it, it actually does recover successfully. It figures out how to reposition the gripper and pick up the object. It can put, pick up this round thing. It can pick up the tennis ball. The tennis ball sometimes slips out of the gripper, and if it doesn't, we're gonna make it slip out of the gripper just to make it extra difficult, and it just goes after it and picks it up successfully. That last thing, that little hook that you see on the floor, that one is pretty hard to pick up. It's a very small object, and it's very awkwardly shaped, so it's going to struggle a little bit, but it is a closed loop process. So if, when it sees itself struggle, it just goes in, repositions the gripper, and eventually gets it right. There we go, it's gonna open again, and now, okay, third time is the charm. All right, so what's next? 
I outlined how we can build model-based and model-free algorithms that can use large amounts of off-policy data to generalize effectively. Uh, what are the, the big challenges that we still need to tackle? Learning new tasks with uh, the current methods I outlined takes quite a bit of experience. Not so much that it's infeasible to do in the real world, but enough that if we want to acquire new behaviors, for example, thousands of different tasks, that's gonna pose a, a major challenge. So if we want to learn new tasks more quickly, one of the things we can do is we can study algorithms that learn to learn, that use their past experience to acquire new tasks more efficiently. So you saw, for example, in the session earlier today, an example of meta-learning uh, presented by uh, Chelsea and uh, uh, Kevin on grasping uh, or sorry, on placing objects and picking and placing objects from demonstrations. We can also do uh, learning to learn and meta-learning for perhaps other tasks like the ones I showed in this talk in the future. One challenge with learning from a diverse set of tasks is that those tasks need to come from somewhere. So I showed examples with random exploration and also very focused tasks where, where we're just learning grasping. In general, if you want a multitask setup, perhaps one thing that we might want to seriously think about is having a robot that can propose new tasks autonomously, practice those tasks, and use that to generalize better. So recently we've studied a little bit how we can automatically propose new tasks. This is a simulated example with a half cheetah system where it's it has learned, in this case, four different tasks without any human supervision. So it's just trying to optimize for the diversity of behaviors and it can figure out how to run forward, backward, do backflips, and so on. And if we can automatically propose a variety of tasks, we can also use them for meta-learning to actually meta-learn policies that learn to learn new human-specified tasks more quickly by practicing on automatically specified tasks. And lastly, if we want to solve temporally extended tasks, then maybe we should think about things like temporal and spatial hierarchy. And we can do off-policy, very efficient learning for hierarchical learning problems as well. So this is an example uh, video of a quadruped robot that learned how to push a block to open a, a doorway to reach a destination using an off-policy hierarchical learning method with the equivalent of a couple of hours of training time. All right, now to conclude, one of the things I wanna come back to is something I mentioned early on in, in the talk, that the hard things, the things that we associate with sort of heavy cognitive load are easy for uh, AI systems, and the easy things, the sensory motor control, are hard. To, I'm gonna leave you with a little uh, hypothesis, kind of a corollary that I'll postulate to this uh, paradox, which is that maybe, if, you know, given that this is true, if we can figure out how to solve the easy things, maybe that'll actually give us a really important clue for how to properly solve the really hard things. If we can solve the easy things in a very general way, maybe it'll make all the more complex, higher level stuff easier. And I have a little bit of evidence sort of by way of an analogy to this uh, corollary, which is an example from computer vision. So it used to be that in computer vision, uh, researchers would spend a lot of time figuring out how to build the right sort of higher level classifiers or detectors on top of hand engineered features. And then we figured out that if we can build deep neural networks that learn the low level features automatically, those same procedures can also acquire very powerful higher level features. So the method that excelled at learning the low level representations ended up also excelling at doing the higher level stuff that we needed in computer vision. And maybe the same will hold in robotics. Maybe if we can figure out the low-level act of sensory motor control, perhaps the solution will serve as a very val valuable signpost to then figure out how to build the household robot, the disaster relief robot, and the robot repairman. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. Um, questions. Don't run away. We have five minutes for questions. There's one upstairs. Oh, you're going to handle this one first and then the green box. Hi, great talk. Uh, so you introduced this model-based uh, learning with a model of a world being kind of represented as pixels, right? But we also know that there exist objects, we know that there's physics, we know lighting, we know all these things and have models for them. Yeah. They seem pretty innate uh, from cognitive science, and we have solved kind of the easy problems of push planning. So we've had done like model-based push planning on a planar surface. So would you say, is there a benefit in keeping representation in pixels? Uh, should we learn physics and objects just like we learn edge detectors in computer vision? Or do you expect to move towards higher level representations and sort of hybrid approaches with such models? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, there's actually two parts to this question. One is the, the planar pushing, and the other one is uh, about objects. In regard to the first part, I think that it's important when we tackle robotic problems, and, and if we're gonna say that these are kind of realistic robotic problems, we need to deal with both perception and control. So doing pushing, for example, in the absence of realistic perception, I think it, it doesn't tell the whole story. And I think once perception is in the mix, 
You can separate it out. You can have it be a discrete component. But once it's in the mix, then a lot of the uh, kind of analytic physics-based solutions become much, much harder. Now, there's a second part to your question, which is if we have prior knowledge, should we find some way to encode it? Maybe not the, the sort of discrete system building way. Maybe somehow we can like, give it to the learning algorithm. And that's a complicated question. It's a, com it's a question that's really about the, the trade-off between bias and variance. So in machine learning, uh, we know that if we, if we take a model and we limit what, it, what kind of functions it can express, which is what we're really doing when we're telling it about physics, uh, we require less, less training data, we're, we have lower variance, but we might incur bias because the particular things we're telling to this model might be incorrect in some cases. And in the trade-off between bias and variance, the important thing is if you're going to tell the model something, tell it something that it can't figure out from the data very easily. If it's something that's obvious from the data, there's no need to tell the model this. Gravity always affects objects here on Earth. The model will figure that out. You don't need to tell it about gravity. If there's something subtle, you know, if you need to consider relativistic effects for pushing objects, maybe you should tell it about the theory of relativity. But the stuff that's obvious from the data, I think there's often little benefit in specifying that. The green box. Hi, so my question's a little bit related, I suppose. Um, so in all the results that you show, you have a static orthographic image. Uh, and I'm just wondering, since you're doing things over pixels, how much do things change when the actual camera is yeah. on a mobile platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is, this is a very good question. And, and we definitely do have a static camera in all those experiments. I think the particular model we're using there, I'm not sure what it would do with moving cameras. We actually uh, haven't tried it. I think that it probably would have some issues, and we might have to develop a better model, a more general one that can handle both moving and static cameras. Uh, so I think that maybe the short answer is, I believe it will work. I think if you just take literally the system I presented here and run it there, it'll have some trouble. But with a bit more iteration, we can make it work. Is there a further question? There's one here in the front. OK, green, and then we'll go ahead. Green box. Uh, why do you think some of the pixel-based approaches work, when, uh, work for closed-loop controllers when the objects are occluded by the end effector? Yeah, this is, this is a very subtle question. So um, the nice thing about learning-based methods is that they adapt to whatever cues are present in the environment. So when we think about geometry, when we think about, for example, 3D reconstruction, occlusion is a really big deal. If you're not seeing some part of the object, you have no idea what's there. The nice thing about learning is that it can exploit patterns. So for example, even if you don't see your own fingers, but, and maybe the, the wrist on that big orange cuckoo arm is blocking you, you know that your fingers are about the same shape that they were before. You know, they didn't just turn into noodles as, as soon as the wrist occluded it. So from knowing those patterns in the world, you can actually infer what's going on even in the presence of occlusions and other issues like that. Of course, we can construct occlusion scenarios that are so difficult that none of this could possibly work, but I do want to emphasize that the ability to extract patterns from the data can make these systems succeed even when it seems like uh, you know, the information they need isn't obviously present in the current observation. The red right box. So um, one of the problems with computer vision, I think, is if you, like, right here. So if you, like, alter the pixel just by a little bit, it completely changes to another uh, object that it recognizes. So do you have, like, the same sort of instability problem, and how do you solve that? Um, it's a little hard to experiment with that because, well, we haven't done the particular experiment you're talking about. I think you're referring to, like, adversarial example uh, settings. Uh, so we haven't done that experiment. I would imagine that these systems would have all the same kind of strengths and weaknesses of conventional computer vision systems. So I'm sure you can construct, you know, an adversarial ungraspable object for this thing. You could also probably construct an adversarial ungraspable object for pretty much any other grasping system because at this point I think that, you know, a, a large number of successful grasping systems use comnets in, in one way or another. Now, there's another part to, your, uh, to the answer to your question, which is the importance of closed loop control. And I think closed loop control can actually be one of the things that tackles this issue to a large extent. Because if you, if you got unlucky, the thing is positioned in just the right way so that it's essentially uh, fooling your, uh, your model, it's going to try to grasp it, it'll fail, it'll push it around. But eventually, if it keeps trying, if it's a closed loop process, it'll eventually get it right, I think. OK. There's one in the very back. It's our last question that we have. So if someone can throw the. Are you ready to catch it? OK. Throw it. Here we go. Good catch. The red box. Clo closed loop control. There you go, yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. So one concern people have expressed in machine learning is with you know, the, the um, extensive use of neural networks is that it become, it's becoming increasingly difficult to compete with companies that can afford thousands of GPUs. Yeah. Do you see that happening for robot learning, at least neural-based approaches to robot learning, that you need a company that has 
14 robots that can collect data? So it's, it's a funny question because actually in this talk I show, you know, I show two projects, one which was done at a university and the other one was done mm -hmm. at a company. Uh, the, pr the model base control was actually done in, in my lab at UC Berkeley uh, by, uh, you know, most of the work was done by two PhD students and it was done actually on one robot. We ran it for about two weeks. Um, the second one, the grasping work, was done with seven robots at a company. Did we need seven robots? We could have done it with like, you know, three robots and, and, and double the time or something. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, there is a real resource constraint, but I think that sometimes uh, people sort of uh, overstate how severe that resource constraint is. Uh, I would actually be more worried about the computational constraint than about the physical hardware constraint. The computational constraint is also real, mm -hmm. and you, know, you, you need to kind of figure out some solution where you can get enough GPU resources and so on. But I wouldn't say that it's, like, at least in my, in my work, I, I wouldn't say that it's been a deal breaker, and it hasn't really prevented me in, in my capacity at UC Berkeley from doing the research that I want to do. Okay. Thanks. Although I would love list, keeping listening to him, uh, I think we need to stop right now and uh, give the people at the poster session also, in the poster session also time. Thank you, Sergey.